born and raised in the UK, Ferris frequently visited Yemen growing up, developing a strong connection to the country. Seeing the massive economic and social challenges Yemen faced, Ferris gradually developed the ambition to dedicate his professional life to improving the lives of the underprivileged and oppressed. After completing an undergraduate degree in chemical engineering at Imperial College London and a master's in engineering at management at the University of Cambridge, Ferris worked in the oil and gas sector for several years, gaining experience in process engineering, business development, and commodity trading. Ferris planned to use his experience for social good, specifically to develop Yemen's energy infrastructure and offer basic power services to the country. But in 2015, civil war broke out in Yemen and forced Ferris to seek alternative ways to support the country. The search led Ferris to working in Yemeni coffee, which he views as a fundamental part of Yemen's history and a critical part of its post-conflict socioeconomic recovery. In 2016, Ferris established Kima Coffee with the aim of generating sustainable livelihoods for Yemen's smallholder coffee producers through reestablishing Yemen as a renowned specialty coffee origin. In 2021, having generated significant impact for thousands of Yemeni farmers, Kima Coffee scaled its social enterprise model globally with the very same aim of generating sustainable livelihoods for smallholder farmers across the world. Kima Coffee established its first sourcing operations outside of Yemen in Colombia last year and aims to continue scaling its ethical sourcing operations across Latin America, Asia, and Africa in the years ahead. This is a fun conversation. Ferris has become a dear friend. Please enjoy the listen, and hopefully you learned something like I did. Cheers. Okay. All right. Dun, 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 dun. Got it. Just asking you for permission. Yeah. All right, Ferris, welcome to the show. Um, Thank you. Man, to be here. <laughs> um, there's like lots of places I want to start, but, you know, let's, let's take a step back before we dive into coffee in Yemen. How did you end up doing coffee? And what's the story of your background to starting Kima? Um, yeah, so thank you for having me. Really glad to be here. I'm excited to, to be talking. So, yeah, like, you know, all of us, I think, to figure out where we're going, we need to look at where we came from. And that's very much the case with me. I didn't come from coffee like many coffee people. Um, I find that's like, like a, a bit of a common reality. You know, many coffee professionals don't come from coffee. I came, I, I'll talk about my general background, born and raised in the UK of Yemeni heritage. Both my parents are from Yemen, were born in Yemen. I um, I grew up all of my life in the UK, but going frequently back to Yemen, frequently every year. So I was connected to the country, connected to everyone. I saw their family, extended family, uncles, aunties, cousins, you name it, the whole shebang. Uh, and very quickly, really at the age of like 10, 12, early teen years, I started to become very, very aware of the inequity that exists between the very privileged and comfortable life I was living for the UK, in the UK. And I wasn't living, I was living a middle class life, I guess. Um, and the, the, the complete opposite of that in, in Yemen, just simple stuff like, you know, you'd go down to the neighborhood and meet with the neighborhood kids and you'd, uh, you'd uh, someone would say, how much the school fees are and it would be it would literally be the price of a meal not even a meal in the uk a bag of chips uh, and i think that really that, that i became very aware of that and initially i was kind of shocked and intrigued by it then i got angry about it um and that meant that i got angry and i was like oh, well i need to do something about it that was really early you know early thoughts that don't cross the normal mind of a, the mind of a normal kind of teenager um, but the, I think the extremity of the situations, the complete polar opposite of, of the two realities struck me. Anyway, so I was like, I want to do something for Yemen. I'm really privileged. I've got all these resources and access and education uh, in the UK. And I want to do something with these people because my family there and I'm kind of connected to it and I feel it. So I, I, that's what I want to do. So I was like, energy. How do I do that? Energy. Right. I don't really like charities because I feel that there's a bit of a problematic power power. You know, power paradigm dynamic right charities all that i want to we want to build something that can sustain itself right where, where where dignity can be preserved so it was all it was always about social enterprise social business for me energy made sense because middle east energy yemen uh, i entered an oil and gas career for five six years with the aim of really getting five to ten years of experience and then going off to yemen and building something beautiful like a renewable energy project something that could sustain communities and really raise the 
macro and microeconomic profile of Yemen, did that for five years. Then the war broke out in Yemen, 2015. When the war broke out in Yemen and you speak to any serious oil and gas player, civil conflict, because Yemen is a civil conflict, civil conflict and oil and gas development projects don't go hand in hand. They don't work together because of the size of risk involved in developing oil and gas projects. So I was left in the situation was like, I got either I continue in this energy successful, very successful energy career, or I cut my losses it was like, what, five, six years career plus five years of education. It was a 10-year commitment up until that day, 10 years of working tirelessly. Or oh, I cut my losses and I do something for Yemen. I had no idea what. So I chose the latter. I chose the latter driven by driven by guilt, maybe more than anything else. And uh, coffee made sense. And uh, why it made sense, I looked into Yemen's history. I saw a lot of interesting things around coffee and history in Yemen. It played a huge role, of course, in Yemen's history. Yemen plays a pivotal role in coffee, both in the past and the future, I would say, for coffee as well. Uh, and so I jumped into coffee and I thought, well, here's a problem I think I can solve. Yemen doesn't sit on the map of coffee anymore. And I think I'd like to, to move the needle on that. And here, here, yeah. here I am. I, okay, so I'm curious to go back and thinking about your childhood and you grew up going to Yemen regularly, seeing these things. And when I hear you say like you're feeling these things, I'm thinking, gosh, I was so like oblivious to the world and its problems as a kid all the way through high school. Uh, so you're like experiencing these feelings. But I'm just curious, was there any connection to experiences in the UK? Like, did you ha also have experiences that fed into that more like being a brown kid and being from Yemen? Like, what, what was that experience like? And I, I, I trust, man, we're going to get to coffee, but I'm just intrigued that this drive to do good, particularly for the people that you have the history with uh, and how our experiences shaped that. Did you have much of that experience in UK or? Absolutely. Um, so I think when you talk about one of the fundamental problems of coffee, it's power dynamics. And I experienced that at a very, very, very young age uh, by way of racial uh, uh, inequity. I was the only brown kid in a white town. I was the only brown kid in my school. Um, so I stood out <clears throat> and back then people weren't as progressive or as open as, uh, as they are now. And so I faced racial abuse from the age of five, wow. from the age where you don't even understand it. Honestly, yeah. when it first happened, I didn't even know. I just thought they were calling me a bad name, didn't know what it was. And then once you come to start to understand that people hate you because of how you look, that's a difficult concept to deal with as a kid. So there was this, there was this, and that made me, you know, that when, if you look at the roots of empathy, Right. Some psychologists will say that empathy is driven by experiencing injustice yourself. And I think that's very much the case with me. Like, I think what drives my want to do social good is because of, from a very young age, I, I faced so injustices that left an imprint on me and that kind of changed my trajectory. So I should be perhaps thankful for that, for those experiences. Yeah, that, but that's, whoa, that's heavy though, right? <laughs> like being yeah, thankful heavy. for something like that. But yeah, that, that, that explosion experience of going to Yemen and seeing that, but then also your own growing up and experiencing things that no child should have to experience. Uh, that, I mean, it, it makes sense. And um, <laughs> I'm just having a hard time swallowing the idea of being thankful for that. That's, that's a, a very powerful way to look at it. Um, Bed's eye view, I guess, but I mean, emotionally, so it's, you know, yeah. said, no child should go through that. Yeah. So coffee in Yemen you said you started looking at the history and you saw this rich, uh, long history of coffee cultivation in Yemen. Now, people who have the slightest bit of coffee, maybe education or just uh, curiosity are going to know that Ethiopia is the founding place of at least the plant. But maybe a lot of people do lose the understanding of what where Yemen played a role. So what what is... What is that process look like, and why is Yemen such a powerful player in the history of coffee? Yemen is it's a powerful player in the history of coffee, and I would say it's it's a powerful will be a powerful player in the future of coffee, or it can be an important power. Maybe is not the right word, an important player. Why? So, as you said, I think you know by way of the genetic diversity and historic literature that, that we can see, we know that Ethiopia, South Sudan, was the birthplace of the coffee tree, right? Of Arabica, anyway, the coffee tree. That's a given. Look at Yemen, though. In Ethiopia, it grew, say, 10,000 years ago. It grew in the lush forests of Ethiopia. It grew wild, right? That's Ethiopia. And then from Ethiopia, we know in the 14th century, it traveled to 15th century, it traveled to, well, maybe at least 15th century, it traveled to Yemen. And in Yemen, there are no lush forests. 
what that means is that in Yemen, you had to plant and cultivate. And that's, that's, that's key. Because that means that although Ethiopia was the first place at the tree, right, where the tree came from and maybe where the tree was first foraged, picked, right? Yemen is the place, first place where coffee was farmed and cultivated. A farm, what is a farm, right? Where is it to farm something? It's to take a crop through human intervention, put it on a, plot, a piece of land and grow the crop, sustain it. So uh, if it's not, it's a forest. Right? That's the difference between forest and farms. So Yemen is the first place, really, is the birthplace of the coffee farm. It's also that, that means it's also the birthplace of the coffee farm. Uh, it's the first time a human took a seed and planted it in an organized way and tried to grow it and cultivate it. Um, so I think, you know, coffee cultivated, and that's why you also see genetic differences between the Ethiopian accessions and what you find in Yemen because they are the cultivated varieties, right? As opposed to the wild Ethiopian accessions. And so that's, you know, so all, every, all the coffee farmers all around the world to some degree, you know, should nod to Yemen for, 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 for giving birth to coffee farming, but also the coffee drink. We know that the Sufis, right? The Sufis, the mystics, the Islamic Muslim mystics of uh, West Yemen, we know that they also discovered the drink, or at least historic literature. The first time that the coffee drink was mentioned is in 1450 by Ali ibn a guy called Ali ibn Abrat Shadli, uh, who was a Sufi who used it uh, uh, for all night uh, meditations and all right uh, prayers. So it's the birthplace of the coffee, cult coffee cultivation, the birthplace of the coffee farmer, the birthplace of the coffee drink, and it's where coffee was traded internationally from, but the pot mocha, you know? So it's also the birthplace of the coffee supply chain, you know? So it's critical. So, um, which, I mean, for a period then, it seems as though Yemen was the only real exporter to the world for coffee, right? I mean, 100% cultivation and, and exports. Yeah, in the 17th century, you know, up to 1680, Yemen was the only source of coffee, uh, exported coffee around the world. Yeah, so... What I'm curious about is, and it, am I cutting out? I'm going to pause here. Is it, am I cutting? Like my sound is being a little weird. I don't know if it's like. Yeah, me, me too. Something's, some, something's happening. It's, uh, it's, it's lagging somehow. It's like when I'm talking, but it seems fine now. It's lagging on my side. I is don't know it? if it's, yeah. So when I'm speaking, it looks like actions are a few seconds later. Let's see. It seemed good for the first little bit. That's uh, fine, yeah. And now when I'm talking, I'm not hearing that little click. So I'm just wondering if maybe my thing wasn't plugged in well or something. But okay. Do you, does it seem clear now? It seems clear. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, um, sorry. The, can you see me? Is it as is, is, is my mouth in sync? Yeah. Because on my yeah. video, on my screen, there's a, there's, it's out of sync. But it's fine. So that means it's on my side. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not too bad. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um. Okay, so so for a while, 100, 200 years through 17th century, coffee was the primary, uh, was really just from Yemen. And so Yemen was the first cultivated farmer, human intervention, creating uh, this plant and then exporting it to the world. Uh, what I'm interested in also is this connection of why coffee left Yemen and the implications of colonialism and how maybe can we say, and I've heard you mention this, that coffee in Yemen was like really the first free farmer. They chose cultivation. There wasn't colonialism in Yemen yet. What is that story like? Yeah. So, um, you know, so when coffee, coffee was cultivated in Yemen, at least from the 15th century up to the 18th century or so, and then during that uh, uh, during that time, uh, it was small farmers, just like it is today in Yemen, who were growing this coffee, and then they would sell it to middlemen. These middlemen would go to where the pot is, Beit Al-Faki, and they would sell it on to, to traders and exporters. So there was a supply chain, and there was bartering and buying and selling throughout the supply chain. But nothing was forced. There was no power uh state or otherwise that was forcing farmers to farm or forcing farmers to sell at a given price the moment it left yemen and was really cultivated on mask and commercially which was in java 
by the Dutch East India Company, was the moment coffee moved from being cultivated by free farmers who could sell the coffee at whatever price they wanted to or felt was fair to them or reasonable, to a, a situation in which the, the colonial power, in that case the Dutch, would force peasants to grow coffee and sell it at a set price. That was forced, right? And then if you go, if you fast forward another 20 years after that, and that's why the, the Yemeni farmers couldn't compete. How would you compete as a farmer, free farmer that sells the coffee whatever price you want versus a farmer who's forced to sell it at the cheap, forced? You couldn't compete. And then if you fast forward two decades or so to the French East India Company in, in Reunion Islands, they went straight out. They got 10,000 slaves, right? They would ship in slaves and ship out coffee. Uh, so that wasn't even like peasants that were forced. They were just shipping in commodities <laughs> and getting these human beings to plant the coffee for them and grow the coffee for them. And there was no price, right? It was just it was bondage. So um, so that was the shift. That was the move from free, really free trade to, you know, col to, to, to a shift in the coffee industry uh, towards colonial coffee production, colonial control, next profit coffee production. Yeah. And I, I mean, it just kind of is mind blowing to me because as th th there's, there's more conversations being picked up, at least within the industry on supply chain issues and how do we, how do we shift the way of thinking? How do we shift more money into the hands of producers and stuff like that? Even if we just glimpse at history of coffee, almost all of it worldwide was done via colonialism But this is the part that I don't hear a lot of people talking about. And this is what I'm fascinated by. So here we have a country that was, one, the first real place of cultivation of a plant, human intervention and creating, creation. Then you have a country that's free trade, choosing to do that and literally exporting nearly all of it for any consumption outside of Yemen. Then you have colonialism kind of come in. And all of a sudden, we see this drastic decrease to where I think it was pretty much by the 18th, 1800s, it's like down to 6% of the global trade. And to today, point, less than 0.1% of coffee sold worldwide is from Yemen, the place that started coffee cultivation. Um, I, I mean... I don't, I, you can't argue with this, these, these historical facts. And so what, what does that mean? And what are the implications I think is, is a, is a big conversation to have, but I guess I'm curious to hear a little bit about as someone like yourself, who's studied both coffee, the history in Yemen and being from uh, having family and background in Yemen, what is the current situation like there now and how, Is that impacting the ability to see that turn around? Because I'm sure the conflict in Yemen is impacting its ability to grow infrastructure around coffee and to export more coffee. Uh, but maybe let's take a step back and just uh, do a quick overview of the conflict and help people understand. Because you mentioned when you're talking about your time and energy, it's a civil conflict. So When we think about civil conflict, okay, so it's happening in the country, but what's happening in the country? What's a quick swath overview that people can maybe get their minds around what's actually happening there? Um, yeah, so just civil <laughs> I, I realize what I'm asking is ridiculous. <laughs> like, no, give us a no, quick no, no, overview. It's a, <laughs> it's a good question. It's a good question because people, you know, people look at the conflict in Yemen and they don't understand what's going on. I think part of the problem is people not understanding. Uh, and, and as you said, within the constraints of, of this conversation, it'll be hard to go to really go into it. But it is a civil conflict. You have at least two parties, one in the north and one in the south. Uh, the one in the north uh, is called, uh, they are called Ansar Allah or the Houthis, depending on which term one is more informal, one is more formal. Uh, and, uh, and they were previously uh, a, 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 previously a, A, a tribal group uh, from the Zaidi community, from a certain religious community uh, in Yemen, who wanted to, uh, who were fighting for more autonomy and more sovereignty within their regions. And they went into several wars with the previous uh, regimes um, for many years. And 
again, not to go too deep into it, but they, through a, lot, a few changes in, 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 in regimes, they are now controlling North Yemen, right? They are the, say, the, 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 the powers that be, they are the local government in North Yemen. And then you have the southern side, which was previously the government that was running North Yemen. They were they, sorry. I should say they were pro, they were running the entire country. They are seen as the internationally recognized government. Um, and when Ansarullah took over North Yemen, they uh, they uh, they escaped to the south. They made Aden, which is the southernmost city. They made it a kind of provisional, a uh, temporary capital. Um, and uh, and they, they represent, in theory, they represent an internationally the internationally recognized government. Now, in reality. So, so, so by definition, it's a civil war between these two parties that are claiming legitimacy. In reality, each of these parties is backed by significant geopolitical players, right? And Yemen is is seen as a, it has strategic importance by by way of where it sits geographically in the Arabian Peninsula, by way of the access it has to Bab al Mandab to 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 sea trade, uh, to international trade. Um, 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 and you, it, it's arguable, but there are also natural resources, especially oil and gas in Yemen, that could be yet to be discovered. So there's, a, there's some interest there and geopolitical players are kind of fighting over it. Uh, and what's well, how it's man manifesting is through through civil conflict. So it is a civil conflict, but I would say, I would argue if it was purely civil, if there was no geopolitical influence involved, it would have probably been over. Yeah, yeah it would, it wouldn't, I don't think it would have lasted as, as long as it is. Right. Yeah, and I guess for people to kind of get a small idea, the geopolitical powers we're talking about. So the Houthis, which are kind of Iran backed, correct? And then the international government, which is Saudi Arabia backed, which then by implication is USA backed. God bless us. Um, what. I mean, for those who don't understand, I mean, you know, it's, it's an interesting time because Ukraine, uh, the invasion of Ukraine and uh, everyone putting a flag on their profile picture to show their amazing support. Uh, and yet we have something that's been going on, obviously much longer oh, back and forth, but actually recognized civil war since 2014-15 and called one of the largest humanitarian crises in, in the world. I mean, right now, data is telling us that out of a country of 30 million people, 80% of them are relying on aid and 60% of them are pretty much starving. And that doesn't even get into the number of children that don't have schools uh, or even food or basic necessities of life. So it's a real problem for sure. Um, and there's no easy answers, but I guess I'm curious how you see coffee playing a role how, when you started getting into coffee. And I don't mean specifically to the conflict necessarily, but let's just generalize and say a role of economic empowerment, a role of uh, developing a country and seeing people thrive once again. Um, how, how have you seen, or how do you see potentially coffee being part of that? And obviously you got into it for a reason. So like, what, where did, what did you see in coffee that kind of, other than the historical significance? I saw, um, I saw two things, I guess. I saw a historic injustice to Yemen, right? Kind of what we spoke about before. Here's a country that really, you know, we owe it to for the cultivated varieties that we have around the world. We owe it to the farmers of that country for protecting and cultivating those coffees over centuries, because that's really what happened. And as you said, the birthplace, the birthplace, the birthplace, and now it's not even on the map, it's 0.1%. So that is a bit of a, it feels unfair. You know, for me, it feels kind of unfair. Why is that the case? You know, Yemen should, should have, Yemeni farmers should have seen some benefit from the centuries of, of cultivation and protection. And then I also saw, I, I saw in coffee a tool for remedying the injustices that are happening in Yemen by way of the conflict. See? So I guess what attracted me to coffee is that I saw it was a problem of injustice, but I also I saw in it that, oh, this could actually be used to remedy, to, to provide some 
positive hope, some 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 vehicle of livelihood generation and hope critically hope because hope and hope and ambition are linked. You know what I mean? Um, and so that's what attracted me to Yemen. That's how to coffee. Um, and um, I guess if you look at if you look at the conflict in Yemen, it's complicated, right? And I would go on the limb and say most Yemenis are tired of it and don't want it, right? I would really go on the limb and say that most Yemenis are tired of it. Most Yemenis just want to see it end. Um, and yet it's a war and wars need foot soldiers and foot soldiers in a complex war where there's no real ideological allegiances. Again, I'm arguing uh, that, that, that then the foot soldiers are really looking for an income. So the point that I'm making is if, you know, the, part, the, the, the humanitarian situation in Yemen is not only a cause for death and destruction for families and children and you know, that, that, that's just beyond, beyond expression, you know, beyond expression. But it's also fueling the war because people need incomes. And if the, if, the, if the only sources of income is to become a foot soldier and not join the front line, then, you know, who can we, who can really say, I mean, I've got two kids at home, you know, I would do anything for them. I'm not sure if I'd go to the front line, but I would do anything for them. You see? So I think if you actually talk about human experience and real human suffering and, and what people would be willing to do to just eat, or at least to have their children or families eat, then you start to understand the, but you start to understand the dynamics behind this conflict. And this is where coffee comes in, right? You know, in a, in a country where people don't really want to fight. We don't really want to fight. And many of the people who are joining the fight are joining because they're getting, a, you know, 50 or 70 or $100 a, a month uh, to just join the front line. Then you offer coffee as something that's powerful and sustainable and can generate an income. And is linked to your heritage. You know, it's linked to your history. It's something you can be proud of because man, our pride is killed. I mean, look at how Yemen is displayed on, 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 on the media. It's just, you know, I mean, it's true. Starving children, starving, it's all true, but that does something to your national pride, to your pride as a human being. And if you kill your pride, then you kill the soul. So I think it's really important. That's why coffee is not just about a generation for Yemen. In the context of Yemen, it's something that's that's been grown for hundreds of years and people are proud of associating with. So you have this magic pill in coffee. That's kind of how I see it. It's this, this magical concoction that brings together all the things that are important for Yemen and that could really do something to, 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 to seriously change the situation in Yemen in the vehicle of, of the drink. You know, it's fascinating. Yeah. Are a lot of the farmers that you guys have worked with in the last few years as you've grown, are they like, are they people that theoretically could be pulled into the war if they didn't have the out of producing good coffee and that you guys have kind of played a role in helping them increase production or get better prices for it. And therefore they haven't had to make that decision. So like you're seeing it tangibly, like people who have been able to make the decision to stay and keep doing something they're proud of and cultivating and making somewhat of a living off that instead of having to go join a war that again, everyone, as you said, is tired of. Uh, yes. So I would say yes, you know, Absolutely, because you don't want to pose the question to most people if you, you know, would you go to a front line or would you let your children starve, right? So we haven't posed that question to people, you know, but what I am sure of is that, you know, we are delivering livelihoods and income generation to families, to households that would otherwise have to make that decision, have to ask themselves that, that awful, that awful question right and it gets a bit more complex yemen's state schooling public schooling right has been non-existent for the last four years right teachers public school teachers have been without salaries for about four years now they get half a salary every six months so they they can't live on that so they go and do other things they go and find other jobs which means schools are empty if schools are empty um and you have children just out doing nothing and you know that in Yemen, many of the of the foot soldiers are children, are child soldiers. Yemen has a serious child soldier problem that many people don't know about. It's a serious problem. Like many, many of the front line are child soldiers. And so if you provide an income to the family and you help them give an education to their children, you're, you know what I mean? Like you're facilitating a better, more productive route for children who are innocent and could be easily misguided or manipulated or, or indoctrinated to do silly things like when we're involved in kids. You know, you know what that means. Yeah. Is that, so I'm just going to take a guess here, but it sounds like that might be a main 
motivator for why y'all started the Kima Foundation, which, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is primarily focused on schools and education, exactly. correct? Exactly. So tell us a little bit about that, because, I mean, I see this loop happening. You know, everything is perpetual right now. Perpetually, there's a civil war and poverty and lack of education. But then it's one thing to go in and say, let's help farmers cultivate more coffee and make more money for their crop. But there's also a few other factors that will allow for the positive perpetual cycle to happen, one of which is education. So you guys started a foundation. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. It's all a cycle. You know, everything's connected to everything. It's a system, really. Exactly. So we set up a, a foundation because we were like, well, Kimokov, I believe in social enterprises, you know, and I have a problem with the development industry, the NGO kind of sector in Yemen. I really do. And I go on a limb to say that because I might make them unhappy. Um, and we can talk about that separately. But uh, I believe in social enterpri enterprises. I think they're good. I think that that's what Yemen needs right now. Entrepreneurs who are willing to change their country. We set up the foundation because there's only so much we can do through the sourcing and processing and trading of coffee. So many things that we want to do, like educate children, it doesn't really fit into coffee trading, right? It doesn't really fit indirectly, but not really. So we said, let's set up a pure non-for-profit, you know, that will really focus on sustainable agriculture, education, and gender justice, which I consider are the pillars, pillars of a sustainable rural community. You know, it's having justice between the genders whatever that looks like for that particular society as long as it's just uh having an education so that you are building tomorrow's tomorrow's you know generation you are building the future of your community you're preparing it and to say every culture because that's where you eat from you know that's 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 what sustains you so um so we set that up in 2018 in yemen we've been doing lots of things we've been sponsoring lots of children and taking them, you know, sponsoring children specifically from single mother households and getting them into some of the best schools in the country um, through multi-year multi -year programs because we don't just want to put them in for a year and, and take them out. Um, and we've been focusing a lot on sustainable, sustainable agriculture because the idea is that we are supporting them now to kind of develop a critical mass in education, but we want, I want them to be able to afford that themselves. You know what I mean? So, and if you give, if you develop the agricultural the, the infrastructure, the farms and, and, and the reservoirs and the nurseries, if you develop enough infrastructure, they'll be able to send their own schools to the best schools, their own children to the best schools. So we're kind of working on, 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 on both parts of it. And I think we're doing some, some, it goes fast to say we're doing some really good work and, and yeah. making some good impact on the ground. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Um, I'm curious, kind of stepping back, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the conflict and the differences from a farmer perspective. Are the farmers that you guys have been working with, are they actually, is it pretty split? Like, are there farmers from kind of more the Shia Muslim side and some from the Sunni Muslim side so that you're actually kind of seeing this, like, is coffee kind of this strange transcendent thing that both both people from both backgrounds are cultivating or is it, uh, is it different? Is it one or the other? Uh, I'm just curious. Cause I, obviously the country's fairly split. I mean, uh, Sunni Muslims make up, I think about 60, 65% of the country and, and the rest being Shia Muslims. Uh, do you see kind of that? There's, are there differences in the coffee growing sections? I think if you look at the spectrum, so Shia and Sunni, for those who don't know, they are different kind of say, sects. Uh, 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 within within the spectrum of 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 the Islamic religion, and I would say it's a spectrum. So it's really a spectrum from you know Sunnism to Shiism, and there are others. Uh, and I would say what's in Yemen first, I guess, as a, as a background in Yemen, the the the, the Sunnis and the Zaydis, which is really the the community that exists there, are very similar in that aspect. They're close in the spectrum. They're quite close. Uh, unlike some other countries in in, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, so there's not that much of a, on a on a on a you know on a, on the ground level. There's not that much of a dif differentiation or distinction between between the two, yeah. and it's it's a good thing. It's a good thing because it makes for a much more pluralistic, yeah. much more uh, you know vibrant and accepting society. Um, yeah. So so I think it's it's it, so I think that's a caveat. Having said that, there are of course differences, um, and coffee does transcend. Coffee does transcend. You are saying, you know, our farmers, first of all, we don't ask 
we don't know, you know what I mean? Right. But right. you do see from a purely geographic perspective, you do see that it's really everywhere. And you do see farmers coming together from across the country over the, the shared heritage and culture and, and love for coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also kind of curious. So let's see, y'all have been in Yemen working with farmers for five years now, six years. Six. Yeah. yeah this is so, six years. and, and you've grown, you know, you've, you've, probably you're working with probably 10 times more farmers than when you first started. One thing I'm curious to get your thoughts on are coffee production at the rate and, and the volatility of it now is slowly decreasing with consumption increasing. So right now it's pretty well known. SCA has said it by 2050, you know, we're going to have an issue. We're going to be short X amount of bags. I forget the number. Um, so, you know, there's all this talk of, what are the options? Uh, you know, I've even heard people say Brazil and Vietnam, even the two highest producing countries can't make up that amount. Um, so people are trying to get creative and I'm over here going, Hey, Yemen, Yemen, <laughs> you know, I'm, what do you think? Cause like they have increased over the last four decades on an average 4% growth a year. Right but it still makes up such a small percentage of total global exports compared to what it did hundreds of years ago. Um, but I mean, this seems like a, a great solution. Obviously we don't have control over the conflict, but do you, do you see that as a viable real solution to the growing coffee production issue? Um, I think I think to, to, to start to address that, you have to look at the kind of the, 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 the supply demand curves of coffee and you have to, you know, have to, you have to ask yourself, let's say there is indeed a shortage. What will that do to the to the to the global prices of coffee in, say, I don't know, three to five years time or 10 years time? And then to look at what's the cost of production of Yemeni coffee. Uh, but more importantly, what's the cost of 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 uh, What's the, what's the cost of what's the sustainable what's the say sustainable farm gate cost price for Yemeni right. coffee? Which I think are two very different questions. Sure. Um, and I think if you see the two intersect, then then maybe you have something that can grow there. But I, I guess some the, I think that then Yemen could be a solution. But I would say the challenge facing Yemeni coffee now. Oh man, there are numerous challenges. <laughs> so I think <laughs> yeah. I, I think I think the, the so I think part of it is the world's much of the coffee consuming world still doesn't appreciate that coffee is indeed uh, uh, it, it can indeed be a luxury item and should indeed be viewed as such and yeah. the decommodification or commoditization of coffee i think that's that that requires a lot of education and conversations and i think i think you know we're well placed to do that you know you're well placed to do that through conversations like these through collaborations like the one that we're having with you guys we can then start to work together to to educate the market and really what you know what 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 it takes on a per cup basis to actually deliver something that's reasonable for the farmer, and it's not so much on a per cup basis, right? On a per per cup basis, because the margins on a cup are, are okay. So I think there's a lot of education there around changing the views from people, the market on on kind of coffee. The other side of it, though, is that people have to understand that we. I think as a coffee industry, before people, because I I think we don't get it, how coffee is, you know, how how do you reach a fair price for coffee? What is a fair price for coffee? And it's radically different for different countries. You know, if you look Absolutely. at it in Yemen, you have a small farm of 10 people, 512 trees on average. And so farmers there to sustain 10 people, they have to sell per kg of coffee to, at a reasonable, at a, at a much higher price than they would in Colombia. So I think there's a lot there. And then I think you also have to ask yourself, what does a farmer need to sustain themselves? Which is the questions we're trying to answer to 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 to, to, off, to, you know, to, to afford a a dignified living, but then also you're an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. What about the ambition of a farmer? Because farm is a business. You know, a farm is a business. It is, a, is a farmer allowed to have ambition to grow their farm and to scale their farm? So I think when we start talking about what is a fair price, I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole, I mean, we can unpack that for it. We need another few hours for that, but I think it's fascinating. I, you know? it, it, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's interesting because when I have these conversations with other people who are directly working with coffee economics, you know, 
It's one thing for us to come to the table and go, let's talk about what a farmer needs to get paid, what's a living wage, and and at least acknowledge that that's going to be different in every single country and even regions in countries. So that's step one. But then the part that, again, I don't think we hear a lot about, and I'm not demonizing anyone, I think it's just the reality of we have to start where I just mentioned, like we have to start at least there, but you just said it. Is it enough to say what they should get paid? What about what about their ambition? What about like if they think to themselves, I actually want to have this opportunity or have my kids go to this college? Who are we to determine what the living wage is? But then it's just, oh, well, it's it's to pay their you know bills and and have food on the table. It's like, yeah, it says we who can go out and get a loan for a new vehicle tomorrow or whatever exactly. it is, you know. Exactly. So I I feel that I want to touch. Okay, so you said ten people, average of five hundred twelve trees. Ten people in the family, five hundred twelve trees. Um, what did you say, you guys? The number you guys have kind of experienced and come up with to have a living wage is how much per kg? In Yemen, we pay three dollars per kg cherry. Three dollars per kilogram of cherry. If you look at the Colombia, we're working in Colombia now, and their typical small holder household has three thousand trees and it's four people, right? Three thousand trees and it's four people. So that's out by a factor of maths, yeah, t- ten or something. Um, and so you can understand, right, why a, Colum- a Yemeni farmer has to sell their coffee at the ten x the price of a Colombian farmer. You know what I mean? Just at that basic basic farm level economics, you know, uh, let alone the fact that Yemeni farmers don't have other jobs. They don't have second sources of income, especially in the context of the war. Whereas maybe a Colombian farmer might have a, might be a, 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 a might have basically an off farm job, whether it's an administrative job or a government job or whatever it is. And in Yemen, they're relying solely on their farm. Um, then, then you start to understand why a Yemeni farmer has to ask for the price that he or she uh, uh, ask for and then you start to understand you know, how to have conversations and, and where things really um, the basis you know the foundation of, of where things start I'm sure this is a complicated question but uh, are a lot of the people you guys are working with are diversified in their crop uh, and their and their farming or is it is it, are a lot of them like really just the coffee is all they have uh, they have three, three in general, if I were to generalize, we did a large nationwide survey, like 150 households across Yemen okay. to answer these questions. And they've got three crops. They've got coffee, they've got cart, and they've got corn. The corn is for subsistence. They eat it. Makes sense. Gotcha. The cart, which is the mild narcotic leaf, is for cash. Right. It's three crops a year. So they take that, they sell it three times a year, and they get some cash. And then you have the coffee, which is heritage, culture, pride, history, and stability. You know, the co- coffee prices in Yemen and the domestic market, they're quite stable all year round. So, uh, so there's this, there's this, you know, there's this three-way symbiotic relationship between the, the main crops that they grow on the farm. And it is indeed symbiotic because we looked at farmers who don't have cut versus farmers who do have cut. And cut is often demonized. You know, if you read literature, they're like, oh, let's convince farmers to remove cut and grow coffee, which is nice on a, maybe on a social on a social basis, you know, maybe as a social science, I was like, is cut good or bad for the economy? That's not my question to answer. But purely on a socioeconomic basis, farm level, we found that farmers that have cut, their yield and productivity for coffee was better because they have more cash from their car to invest in their coffee. So it's all really complex. But for us to ask, answer these questions, we've got to go deep. You know what I mean? We can't, we can't be looking for one-liners to put on our websites. We have to go deep. And I think that's, that's what the coffee industry, that's the direction it needs to move. You know, if we're really serious about, tack- about talking about living income, talking about farm-level economics, we've got, to, we've got to dig deep into, into farm dynamics. And I think that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's some good headway being made. I mean, I, I recently read Carl Weinhold's book, Cheap Coffee, and been talking with him, and we have an interview later. Um, and I think the thing that uh, I keep hearing from people who are passionate about the same thing is just the transparency. Like, if, if, if there's not a radical transparency on the cost of the farmer, but that requires more than the cost of the farmer, it requires cost of production, it requires the cost of living. I was talking to one person recently who said they came up in Mexico, they came up for a single two hectare farmer, uh, coffee farmer, you know, 
the, the, the amount they need to make to just even be semi living wage is a hundred pesos per kilo, which is like way more than what pretty much anyone's paying uh, by 20, 30%. And so, uh, yeah, it's going to take time. And there's like the, you know, there's power dynamics and bargaining issues uh, for sure. So uh, I love that you guys are doing that. I think it's, it's, it's step one for sure. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, man, where do you, where do you want to go? Like, is, is there, I, I we, we've covered a good bit of grounds, 40 minutes. I, I, I'm not trying to make these so long that people are losing interest. Um, do you feel like there's anything that we power dynamics. missed? Power, power dynamics. Power you know? dynamics. I think, yeah, yeah. What, what you're almost closing on. I think it's, it's something to just bear in mind. And for people, I think, again, as an industry, we have to, we have to acknowledge and I'm sure we are, and we are, but I think we have to be more aware of the power dynamics that exist in the coffee supply chain, especially the ones that have a legacy and a history driven by colonial colonial paradigms and past. So what I mean by this, I think, I think it's important for the market to appreciate and to understand, you know, but if I talk about it in the sense of, with respect to our, our industry, um, for roasters, for importers, right? For anyone who buys green coffee to understand how weak a position, the, the power, the psychological power position of a smallholder farmer is in a negotiation. I think it's very hard to understand until you are there. And let me give you a, an example. I, um, I, a practical example. I grew up in the UK. I consider myself British and, and, and equally Yemeni. I, I embrace both parts, but you know, I am British and, um, and I have access to resources. I've had one of the best educations in, in the world and the best institutions in the world. I've, had, I've joined the best energy uh, companies in the world. I've had a very privileged and successful life and I've been used to, despite, despite racial complications, right? But I've been used to being treated with a certain degree of respect, right? That's just pre-coffee. Let's say pre-coffee. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just, just by function of being here and all that. And then I get into coffee, and I'm still who I am, with the resources that I have, with the you know with the access and the knowledge and the education and all that stuff put together. And then I go to a coffee show, and I present green coffee. You know, coffee, and I feel I literally feel you know and it's really hard to appreciate this unless you're there you feel powerless i felt everything that i had was stripped and i felt like a powerless smallholder farmer who was being looked at literally you know like a smallholder farmer from god knows where i don't know where you're from look like a smallholder farmer you know what i mean the same you know your color fits the bill your look fits the bill i'm sorry put your sample there and 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 you know and we'll and, and, and please stop you know stop cramping our style really and this is not a one off and i have to say like it's not sinister it's not sinister you know it's not it's not a, this is not about blaming or, i think it's very hard for because i'm also a market now right i'm also a buyer of 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 green coffee but i think it's very 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 hard to appreciate how powerless how weak that position is in the supply chain it's really really weak and you are desperate and especially you're especially desperate if you're living is depending on that. Your livelihood is depending on that. So I think it, you know, my message would be, and I didn't the, the, the idea about you know we'll, we'll, to close with a message or anything like that. Um, maybe it's maybe maybe we're opening another discussion. But I think it's it's just for the industry to be very aware of how difficult those positions are. And as someone who has lived the life of 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 living a very privileged life in, in the West, so to speak, and was used to that 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 existence, and just suddenly because I think of how I look to be treated. As as a, you know, to be looked at as a small farmer, I felt how powerless that is with all the resources and advantages and privileges I have. So I can only imagine what it feels like for someone that doesn't have that. And I think I'm very aware of that. And I think some of the industry should, should just explore more and talk about more. It's, yeah. it's sensitive and complicated. Yeah. No. I I mean, I think this is why um, I'm I'm really excited to be working with you know Phyllis. Uh, a little bit with her Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity, because I think what I'm learning is, I mean, again, I, I, I hear stories like yours and I go, man, that sucks. But then I have to ask myself, like, how have I contributed? And I think, like you said, it's not intentional a lot of times. Uh, I'm sure there is intentional 
uh, 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 prejudice out there, but a lot of times it's not because it's just so ingrained from the decades and centuries of power dynamics. Um, and I guess that's, that's the first place to start is simply acknowledging, but also continually looking at how we're seeing things is really, it's, it's a daily process. It's like anything. It's like, am I, am I going to learn more about my industry today? I got to read something new or learn. It's the same thing with how we view the world, our lens, our biases, our perceptions, our implicit biases. Um, so no, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's wild, man. And, and I think that paints a good picture because as I talk to people about the, the, um, the farmers basically helplessness, it, it just paints a whole new picture to hear how someone like yourself experiencing a similar feeling. It just, it just, it's, it widens that gap even more and, and says, man, okay. Like how, how do we overcome this? So um, yeah. I think the exhortation to people is, is let us not uh, uh, continue to look at our, ourselves and how we see the world, how we see farmers, how we see our industry, how we see people that don't look and sound like us um ferris i i mean yemen is, is is a complicated place the conflict even the coffee history is complicated uh we can only hit so much and i'm grateful for the time um so uh just so people know all of this information will be linked in the show notes we're going to have links go into other places to learn more in education and resources um, and continue to expose and create opportunity for radical transparency on what, what people are getting paid and how that's impacting their lives uh, as well as even linking to Kima foundation. So people can go check that out and see if that's something they find uh, some passion in uh, being a part of. So, and we definitely encourage everyone to, find that thing, you know, and, and if you want to uh, be a partner and donate to Kima Foundation, uh, you'll find more information uh, in the show notes. Uh, Ferris, thank you. Thank you so much, man. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan and obviously just a cheerleader for what you guys are doing. And, uh, you know, if, if, if you're listening and you don't realize this, the relationship started because we won lot three at the first Yemenia auction. We didn't even get to Yemenia, but that's a whole, if you want to, if you want to learn about Yemenia as a new mother species genetic, I'll link that in the show notes as well. Uh, but we continue to buy, uh, Yemen. We, we have a Yemen that's currently in our Mocha Java that is from Kima. Uh, so Go buy that and uh, let's continue to try to support these farmers. So uh, I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. I mean, a shout out to you and the team. You guys are really, you know, leading the way on, on what needs to be done. I think in equity, in transparency, in justice. So a huge shout out to you guys. And it's, it's, it's really an honor to be working with people like you. It's, really an honor. Uh, it's, it's the collaboration. It takes takes all of us, right? So Thanks very much. Man. All right. Well, peace out, brothers and sisters. Take care. Thank you for listening. Get mad. Get mad, please, coffee.